Good evening to everyone joining us from Turtle Island tonight and welcome to this event at the Art Gallery of Southwestern Manitoba. My name is Lucy Letterhandler. I'm the curator here and it is my pleasure to have you with us for this special event on the occasion of the exhibition of paintings by Dermot Dector titled Lost and Otherwise Found, which is on display here through December. You will see, I think, that these paintings, mostly portraits, show a lot of displacement, and that displacement can happen in many ways. Folks can get forced out of place, or the place that holds the spirit of a person or people can be so violently and irrevocably changed that the connection of the spirit is broken. So let's acknowledge and honor the fact that tonight's event is happening on the lands of what can be called Treaty 2 territory in the city of Brandon, Manitoba, just upriver from the Assiniboine Rapids. Land that has been drastically changed over a short period of time, and land which is the homeland of the Meti Nation, as well as the traditional shared lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dene, and Dakota peoples. Now, rather than introducing you to Derry Dector right now, I will introduce this video, a new one in our series of local artist spotlight features, and I will let you him tell you all about it himself. A huge thanks to our behind the scenes team, videographer Javon Harding and Anna Camello, who did graphics and also keeps these live streaming virtual events running so smoothly. Please feel free to engage with each other and with Derry and myself via your comment section, and we will be able to respond after the video when we meet right back here for a more in-depth conversation. Now, please enjoy Finding Faces with Dr. Derry. My name is Derry Dector. I'm Dearman, technically. I'm named after a very weird and obscure Irish hero. Um, my mother was Irish. Grew up in Winnipeg. Um, father was a doctor. I was kind of slated to be a doctor in a sense on my father's side. I guess technically I was supposed to be a writer, um, but I find art, as Jan says, uh, art says things that you can't say in words. And uh, I hear a lot of words in the course of my day job. When I'm doing this, I'm already thinking of what it's going to be. Um, you know, I pretty much know now what the picture is going to be. Um, I mean, um, I don't know if it's a man or a woman, but definitely there's the picture. That is either one or two figures. I don't know if you can see it. I painted when I was a kid. I uh, painted from age six to, you know, the end of high school. Um, then I stopped. Um, I began painting now, uh, I guess in the last four or five years. I mean, I started with, it, it was interesting. I started with uh, Yan with art restoration. I collect, uh, or over the years, I've collected many things, silver, clocks, porcelain. But I collected a lot of artworks, um, many of which were distressed and required uh, restoration. So Jan uh, Brantswich was, was restoring things. He does that part-time. And uh, after a while, he said to me, and this is 10 years ago, he said to me, you know, I'm getting old. I better teach you how to do this because I won't be around forever. So, you know, he taught me how to do the basics of our restoration. Uh, and then that progressed to drawing and painting. There's an old Zen adage that uh, when the student is ready, the master appears um, and vice versa. You know, the master appeared. I mean, uh, Jan has been teaching art for uh, 50 years. Uh, he's uh, he's a, a great artist himself and uh, I think an even better teacher. Um, so we progressed from, you know, the very basic stuff. I mean, he he's trained in the academic school like 60, 70 years ago in Poland. So, um, you know, so I had to do a year of drawing, which I shortened to six months. Um, we did the art restoration. At some one point, he wanted me to mix up pigments like from, you know, I mix my own paints, which it turned out he was kidding, but I still have a collection of raw pigments at home. 
Um, yeah, and so we progress through it. I mean, it's a, it's a dynamic relationship. Um, and I think Jan said it best uh, when I was, you know, trying to describe a picture. He said to me, you know, if you can say it in words, you should be a writer. You know, art says visual art, uh, painting being the medium that I'm in right now. And visual art says things that are not easily said in words, and and then can be quite and can be quite profound. I mean, a lot of people have very profound um, moments in their life in front of bits of art, um, and that's the, that's the purpose of art. Art is a different way of seeing the world. It allows you to develop, um, and if an artist is good or, or even better than that, it allows you to see into the mind of the artist and how the artist is seeing the world. I mean, if you see something as good, you should be able to appreciate its, its goodness. And connoisseurship, it's a term that's really fallen out of favor, uh, fairly so, um, because it became um, hackneyed, but, but I think it's real. There's a real phenomenon there. So, you know, the, the works that I, um, emulate that I, I incorporate into my works are the works from the past that are good and that I like. I mean, it changes from time to time and pushes me to portrait work uh, because uh, he thinks it's more profound. I mean, I, I paint lots of different things. Uh, you know, if I'm painting a landscape, I'm thinking more of Constable and Turner and, uh, and of course, Van Gogh. I mean, uh, and French Impressions. I, I like, you know, the way that they handle light and paint and color. I mix paint without thinking now. I mix a color, um, it comes out a certain way, that's the way I want it. Um, I don't have to think what I'm mixing together until afterwards. I want a certain green, I mix it, um, and it's done almost instantaneously. So I paint oil on paper. Um, it, it's, it combines the immediacy of, of watercolor with the rapid absorption into the paper you have very little time to, um, to, to correct. Uh, you can do some overpainting, but you better do it in the, like right now. So you have to make decisions very quickly. So the portraits go there. It's a four or five stage process, depending on how, how well it comes out. So there's a kind of a sketch. So, you know, the sketch is sort of in my head. So there's an automatic process that creates a sketch and underpainting of sorts, um, and then an underpainting of washes. And then after that, um, um, anywhere from one to three goes at it with, uh, with pigment painted in anything from washes to color, dense color um, fields to create what I'm creating. Uh, portraits are paintings of, of people, um, you know, painting of their souls. I mean, if you get it right, I mean, painting of the essence of who they are. Um, we live in a very difficult bit of history right now. I mean, a lot of things are changing. The pandemic hasn't been helpful. In my day job, I see a lot of people who are in a lot of distress. Uh, I mean, my job is to try and help them insofar as I am able. But, you know, I mean, we live in a period of time which is very hard on people. So, you know, the, the souls that I see um, and paint are, are lost. I mean, we are in a period of time where a way has been lost for many people. We have some fabulously wealthy people. We have a lot of very poor people, and we have an enormous stress in our society because of the discontinuity between that. So many of the pictures are people under stress, uh, people who are refugees, people who are um, dispossessed in various ways. Uh, so I find them. Jan hates putting titles on pictures, so. You know, he always makes up joke titles for the pictures as I as I as I paint them, and I make up a few too. I probably leave them untitled. The more I paint, the more I want the viewer to make their own judgments. I mean, it, the the only thing that matters is that it connects with the viewer, and the viewer gets something from it. And that's that's all that matters. And that's all I got to say about that. Thank you. I, uh, I really like that we, we're bringing this back. You know, we started the vernacular spotlight in um, in the beginning of the year for a prairie vernacular, which was the the exhibition that I um, first arrived here during. And it was such an amazing, fruitful chance to get to know 
how um, really get a sense of how um, reflective all of the creative souls in Brandon are and, and everybody's different approach to art making. And so I'm, I'm so happy that we got to uh, to keep those words of Derry's in the archives now. So with that, let me bring um, Derry up here, who I hope is not mortified. This is an opening. This is the launch of the video for him as well. I, uh, yeah, I, I had not seen the video before, but yeah. I, I'm not mortified. Hooray, Javon Hooray. will be delighted. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the uh, you're 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 quite adept at talking about your work, um, and it seems like there's something um, almost improvisational about the direction that you choose to take your thinking. We've we've had many conversations. We met uh, um, for uh, when it was cold before it was summer. We met to go through the paintings in the first place. Um, do you, do you feel this way or do you think that you have um, a, a, a mutable sense of, of the reasons that you paint or what you're trying to achieve? You certainly have, have switched gears a little bit since this exhibition has gone up. Yeah, um, yeah, I mean, I think artists work because they have to work. I mean, you start doing stuff, it, it's it, one thing leads to another and you, you know, there's a compulsion. It's kind of an obsessive compulsive kind of phenomenon. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm sure it's, I know it's true for musicians. I know a lot of musicians, uh, uh, probably more musicians than artists and they just can't, you know, they can't leave it alone. Um, it, the art changes. I, I go through different phases, um, you know, handling of paint, colors, um, you know, the color palette changes, um, yeah. but the thought process I mean, we, we as a, you know, we're, we're living in a very difficult, but also a very interesting bit of history. I mean, climate is in trouble. I mean, we're in the yeah. middle of a pandemic. Uh, there's a huge uh, disparity of wealth in the world. Um, and, you know, there's been some political upheavals, uh, particularly in the States, uh, uh, that have left people, um, you know, gasping, I think, you know, uh, it, it, so many things have changed. And, and, and I think they're reflected in the painting. Um, I hadn't really realized it until, you know, the two of us started looking at them, you started putting them together and selecting them. And I was very, it was educational for me to see it like that. I mean, there are some that are just sort of, not just, but their relationships, how I see other artists and how I see that, you know, mm -hmm. how they would be painting if they were alive now. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of the stuff is, uh, is, you know, there's a lot about refugees. There's a lot about how, um, you know, how, how we live in a displaced world where, um, where a lot of things, I mean, Brandon, it's not so much, you know, because we've been relatively spared in the pandemic and we've been relatively spared in, yeah. you know, the climate change stuff. I mean, you know, um, um, but even here, you know, you can see the stress that a people are in because of this. And, uh, and that's a problem. I mean, it's, it's something that humanity is going through right now and, I, and the works that I paint reflect it. When I um I wrote the the short copy um, for your exhibition, and I talk about uh, pareidolia, uh, which is the the tendency to find faces mm -hmm. in in chaos to 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 reconcile that chaos into a pattern um, that looks like a human face, and I you, you you kind of joked in this video that Jan encourages you I think it was in this video encourages you to make portraits because he thinks it's kind of a, a higher art. Um, but I think that you also really enjoy it. Certainly when left to your own devices, you make them as well. Yeah, well, I do. Um, you know, I mean, Jan has pushed me in that direction. I still, when he's not around, I, I paint some landscapes and florals that mm -hmm. I don't generally show him. But um, yeah, um, yeah, I think he's right. I, I do think somehow um, portraits and maybe maybe certain forms of abstract art are really the highest and maybe not highest, the purest form of of artistic expression that you can get from dabbing pigment on substrate you know i mean that's it's a pretty it's a pretty basic thing that that a painter like myself does i mean it's really unchanged since the neolithic age except for the materials you have something that's relatively flat and you take something that's relatively colored and you try and create this image that captures people's attention um, mm -hmm. um and says something and and uh you know so um there's a primitive aspect to that but i think it's a very visceral aspect um um, the portraits, I mean, I think portrait work is the most difficult form of painting um, in the sense that, you know, you can do cartoonish stuff, you can do, 
kind of hackneyed stuff and or you could and you see a lot of artists and i, I don't mean to be critical of other people but you, you see a lot of even quite well-known artists who paint the same thing over and over again you know they mm -hmm. they paint the same eye and they paint the same nose and they paint the thing and and that's okay i'm even you know even in rembrandt i have a book at home called rembrandt's eyes and you know rembrandt's eyes are fantastic but mm -hmm. for about 20 years they were the same eye you know not everybody has the same eye um Again, not a criticism of Rembrandt, who have great, you know, a great deal of respect for as a painter, but it is very difficult to not fall into the habit of doing something in portraiture that is that is easy. Right. Um, and so, I mean, I, I find myself falling into it sometimes. You just paint the same kind of features with a little variation, but I mean, to be original, and and I think it's, I mean, everybody, every everybody, every person is kind of original. And so everybody has to be painted with that sense of originality. Like, you know, I'm not going to paint, you know, this guy looks like George Clooney, but I'm not going to paint him like yeah. George Clooney because, because I, even though I've painted George Clooney 10 times, because he's not actually George Clooney. I mean, I'm just saying that. It's interesting because you've also built that into your process. Like what we saw in the video of the underpainting, you popped right. it up on your easel and you said, oh, look what it is, right? Well, when, when I originally started painting, I mean, and this is, this is, um, I mean, when I was, when I, I went through a group of seven phase and I, you know, I, I think if you're a Canadian painter of a certain age, it, it's, it's almost impossible not to paint a few group of seven landscapes because, you know, yeah. it's in your blood, right? You know, and, and, uh, and I grew up um, in Winnipeg, but I spent a lot of time in the Canadian Shield. So it wasn't, a, it wasn't an artificial um, or unfamiliar landscape for me. I spent most of my childhood in it. Um, but then I noticed in the landscapes as they became more abstracted, I, there would be faces, sometimes hundreds of faces. I mean, they would just kind of appear. And, you know, I, I was amused by it, but a little confused. Um, I remember something Leonardo said, um, Leonardo da Vinci, not to me personally, but he said, um, he said, you know, you're always painting your own face. It's not just that you're painting faces in things, you know, you just see faces in things, but you see your own face or his own face in that in that particular case uh, he was kind of a funny looking guy so you know it's like it took I a lot he of was beautiful when he was young yeah yeah maybe <laughs> who knows what i'm not old enough to remember yeah. <laughs> uh, i do want to say I've, I've remembered that you can't see the the comments but you have some friends uh who are watching we have sebastian and w a wakeham who are saying hello with their families okay. well yeah. that's nice hello <laughs> They're talking to you and you can't see it, but I'm, I'm yeah, well, their regards. Yeah. I yeah. tend to be a bit like that. I mean, <laughs> I tend to get lost in things. Yeah. yeah, which is fine. I do want to, um, if we could share the uh, little virtual tour. So you are not in front of uh, a fancy green screen. You're actually in the exhibition space right I now. I am. Yes. Um, so we're just going to talk and I'm going to idly flip through. So we have some oh, okay. wonderful Fair shots enough. from yeah. Doug. And if anything strikes us, I'm hoping. So uh, this is kind of what you were you were speaking, where you you make these faces um, with um, you. It's almost impossible in your process to make the same eye twice. You you have um, you, you you imply things with with the stroke. Yeah, I think that's I think that's true. With the process I do now, it's very difficult to to be repetitive. Yeah. Um, I mean, but I did go through a phase where, yeah, I mean, you know, I painted an eye a certain way. You learn to paint an eye a certain way and nose, and it's better than the other ones. So you tend to use it over and over again. The randomness of the process to a certain extent. Um, you know, I was I was kind of blown away when you described it as a mixed with equal part of scholarship and chaos. And and, and I, I really thought about that a lot. And and and, and I think it, it's true. I mean, like this picture, well, that the last yeah. picture that... I mean, that's uh, that's Van Gogh. I mean, so the scholarship is like I've always been upset that Van Gogh, you know, killed himself. I mean, I, I, I worked for 15 or 20 years part time in a psychiatric facility. Uh, I've, mm -hmm. I've, you know, I've worked 40 years with psychiatric patients. Uh, and the idea that that someone who I was so um, impressed with as an artist and, and you know, the, the deepness of what he was doing would would kill himself. Um, 
was deeply distressing to me. I mean, all suicide is depressing and, and, and disturbing and distressing, but his in particular, because it seemed kind of like a comment on the art world. So perhaps I glommed onto the idea that, that you know, that, I mean, there's been a movie out recently that made a very strong case that he was murdered. And, and I think it's, 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 it's true. So this is a picture of, you know, of, of, of Van Gogh out in a f the field where he was murdered. I and mean, there's a lot of kind of um, references, if you know, uh, uh, you know, about the artistic practice of Van Gogh. Um, I mean, there's Van Gogh's hat, but I've made it smaller. I've made his head smaller, um, you know, um, because somehow he was diminished at that point. Um, the sky references uh, the Bruegels with the tiny little birds and stuff in the sky. And, uh, and, and the green's uh, very significant as well, eh? Yeah, the greens are very significant. I yeah. mean, to me, I mean, you know, even though Van Gogh, um, Van Gogh's uncle was was a, a noted painter, um, uh, Mauve, a very depressing but noted painter, um, and he taught him a bunch of stuff. He painted in the academic uh, style, um, and there are certain ways you mix color. And Van Gogh, of course, paid no attention to that. He just did whatever he wanted, particularly with yeah. the greens, and and um, you know, so that's an homage to to uh, to Van Gogh. Uh, you know, a, a guy who, to me stands outside the world of art. I mean, he's, he's an artist like Picasso kind of in a different way. I mean, there was just something very singular about Van Gogh's um, um, vision and his execution. And, and yet, you know, enormously tragic because it wasn't appreciated at the time. Um, it's a funny, funny thing, isn't it? I've um, uh, this year in, in particular, um, because of various reasons, um, really been thinking about the idea of beauty and art, which are not necessarily synonymous at all. Um, but uh, in Shelley Nero's um, exhibition, which we had in the summer, um, she had a line in one of her descriptions that said, beauty is the wanted feature here. And she was speaking about the portrait on the on the uh, bison nickel, the buffalo nickel. And yep. I'm working with, with students now where I'm asking them the same thing. What's the point of making something beautiful? And I think that a huge part of the tragedy of Van Gogh is that he made beautiful things and it's hard to it's hard to imagine that somebody uh, lived in a world that was that beautiful with that much tragedy right? yeah fair enough i mean i i when i look at them now um and particularly when you look at them in in real life you know the the you know i mean video and, and online and, and you know that gets better and better but you know um i remember i mean coming across a, a van gogh uh, in a gallery uh, just sort of walking and not knowing it was there uh, turned the corner and there it was, and it's just it's mesmerizing. But you can feel the pain. I mean, you you can mm -hmm. feel the, the 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 joy, but you can feel the enormous amount of suffering that was going on. Um, yeah. You know, in, in terms of the painting, it really comes through, and uh, and it's uh, it's it's um, it's 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 absolutely mesmerizing. Mm -hmm. We have uh, Sherry with a quote from Cicero: um, "Eyes are the windows to the soul," and then yeah, we have. Fair uh, a compliment from from Anne as well, who is really enjoying this. Let's continue down the hallway. So uh, for people who haven't been able to visit in person, um, these photographs are pretty much in order as you walk northward um, down the community gallery. Um, so they're gonna be grouped as I grouped them, which is this uh, conversation that we were talking about. I, I look for things that are in dialogue with one another. Um, yeah, if you, if, you, if you go back, if you, is it possible to go back one, um, that one? I mean, you know, I see the, the, the figure in the back is, is me, um, you know, looking at things. I mean, uh, I, you know, I, I often cast myself in the picture uh, as an observer of, of what other people are doing. The, the palette here and the, and, the, and the sense is really of the German painters uh, of the 1920s and 30s, you know, yeah. who are coming out of the First World War, the horrors of that, and and yet at the same time, uh, could see that that something really big and something really bad was about to happen, and and you know, so you know, he you know is is a German fellow painted in the suit uh, um, of a close of that time. Um, to me, he looks like he understands that that you know things are going to get really horrible. And, and you know, I, I, I look at these things and I, I try and be, uh, I'm not disconnected from them, but I mean, that bit of history may have, um, may have um, uh, 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 resonance. May, may, may it, we may be going into a period of sort of like fascist history like that again. And so it's like mm -hmm. something you really got to think about. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Um, one of my, uh, my staff members who's 
commenting as the art gallery <laughs> is reminded of Chaim Soutine. In this uh, Chaim Soutine, I love Chaim Soutine. Uh, you know, he's, uh, he was such a strange guy. Yeah. Um, you know, when Modigliani died, he said to um, one of his friends, I, 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 he said to you, I give, I give, uh, I give Soutine. You know, because he was a he like I mean he was a crazy Russian who didn't bathe or eat or he yeah. just drank and then um, and and he just lived right on the edge. I mean he was a he was a one of the twenty seven club except that you know he had really good friends who really cared about him enough to keep him from dying for a long time. Uh, but he was very much in the moment. You know, I mean uh, his bellhop, um, one of my favorite pictures. Uh, you know, uh, I mean there's just a certain. You know his ability to paint a um, um, a humble sort of guy caught in this weird. I mean, you know, if if you work in particularly in that time, if you if you you dress up in the uniform of a bellhop, you work in a, a giant hotel. Everybody there is rich. You're from a different part of society, so there's this enormous tension between all of these kind of things. And yet, he painted him with a great deal of sympathy. And yet, you know, there's a certain sorrow and anger in the picture. Um, I try and paint emotion. I, the pictures I try and capture some sense of, uh, an, I mean, I try and create an emotive link with the viewer, successfully mm -hmm. or unsuccessfully. That's what I'm trying to do. Mm -hmm. um, Keep going down the hallway here. You stop me whenever you want to. I think that uh, the, uh, this, this grouping is really obvious with that. This, this, this is my, this is a picture of my, my myself and my two brothers. I'm the one in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, my older brother's on the right and my younger brother's on the left. Um, um, this is us looking at a, a cityscape again, looking at um, you know, when, when, when um, the previous president of the United States was tearing the whole place apart down there, it, it looked for a while like, um, you know, I said to a friend of mine, are we in Germany 1936? I mean, are we, are we just about to enter into a fascist dislocation that's going to kind of destroy the world? Um, you know, refugees everywhere. And so to this picture to me is the three of us contemplating that. Um, when you have brothers uh, or family, you kind of all start in the same place, but you end up a little differently. I mean, my brother is a, um, my two brothers ended up being a little more right wing and a little more left wing, a little richer, a little poorer, you know, a little different, but we all have, we all have the same initial point of view um, from, a, you know, a fairly left wing family um, that would look on a refugee crisis with a great deal of uh, anger and, and also sympathy. Yeah. So, yeah. These are these are family pictures. I mean, there's um, um, for a while I was collecting what are called holy families. It's a Renaissance composition okay. of uh, of uh, you know of um, father, mother, and baby. Um, the bambino is 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 uh, is uh, is the Christ child, but 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 I mean, it's really a reference for all families. You know, all so, you know sort of thing and the the sense of how people feel. Um, so I find myself often painting three figures, of, um, mother, father, child, um, and then at different ages. <laughs> I'm, not sure, I'm not sure why you picked that one. That's a weird picture. What, this one? No, the uh, the one in the greens. It's, uh, it's um, I mean, it, it's it's from a series, uh, that this is from Judges, which I, is part of actually a larger show where I, sort of kind of examine Christianity from a point of um, uh, my readings of various works. I mean, this is, uh, I mean, the, 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 the quote, I mean, you know, you know, I mean, obviously judges from the Bible. I mean, the, the, uh, um, the question is who judges the judges? And that, that's what we're in a period of right now, who, who judges the people who are judging us. Um, and in this picture, I was a little more pretty direct. I mean, the three judges are not very, sympathetically painted and that's me in the background with my arm folded and it's clearly i am judging the judges and they're not mm -hmm. really they're not they're not being judged in a positive way um uh i i guess i don't know I, well i'll tell you uh and especially I'm, I'm kind of laughing if there are any students joining us that artists sometimes do things by accident but curators never do and i would like <laughs> for the audience watching from home to just look at the conversation that's happening aesthetically between this series of, of works and, yeah, and the journey that we're going on. What, what I meant about that one with the green background is that that's from a, a, a different sort of different series of things. Uh -huh. And for me, it only makes sense 
if it's included with about 10 or 15 other paintings because it's sort of an evolution. Like like the the, the woman here that, 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 that's kind of right behind me, the woman who's screaming, yeah. um, is from a series of uh, 15 paintings where I kind of morphed. Uh, it occurred to me that that singing and, and screaming um, in terms of how you look, I mean, your mouth is wide open, it's turned down in a certain way, and, and your eyes are often shut and you're looking up a little bit, that it, it's a very similar facial expression. And so uh, I thought of Sailing to Byzantium. I mean, it's a poem I like a lot. And, and you know, it's to talk about singing school. So it was from a series called Singing School, um, which is really about uh, the transmutation, like to a certain extent, but what, what it's kind of a shorthand for Van Gogh. I mean, Van, what Van Gogh did is take his own personal suffering and turned it into, you know, paintings of great beauty um, with the suffering kind of as a subtext, you know, you can kind of see it if you want, but, you know, why would you want to? Because the picture is so beautiful. Um, mm -hmm. This is a refugee picture. I mean, I'm the guy in the center, I think, you know, I'm not sure why I paint myself as a pirate with pirate patches or sunglasses, but um, yeah, I mean, um, I mean, it's hard to explain, but I mean, there's obviously the barrier between, I mean, look at Poland right now. I mean, you know, Poland and Belarus, and, uh, Belarus. I mean, they, you know, the, the, uh, the, Yan doesn't like me to make political statements, but you know, you, you take 20,000 people and you use them as hostages to try and force the EU yeah. to do something for a bad man. I mean, it's like, you know, I, I, I mean, it's bad enough to be a refugee, let alone to be used as a, you know, body hostage for horrible people. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of feeling I was trying to capture. Yeah. Um, yeah. These are a series of four that I just grouped for the, the sake of their um, saturated color um, because yes. it's a, a different uh, approach for you. Again, that's a very difficult one. Yeah, this this uh, to, to describe without being in, seen in sequence. This one is about color mixing. I was experimenting with a new technique that was kind of... Um, kind of from um, Turner, you know, his sort of scrumbling technique. And you can't do that on paper because the Paul's really grinding away with pigment, uh, you know, on the pigment and sanding it and smashing it and stuff. And the substrate, the oil, the paper won't take that. So I was trying to create that sort of luminous, dappled kind of intense effect with the colors that um, without destroying the paper. I did, I did actually tear some papers apart trying to get it to work. Um, you can get it, you know, you can, I use very heavy paper. I use 140 pound uh, watercolor paper. So it can take a, it can take a licking, but you know, it, it, um, at a certain point it just gives up. And once it starts to come apart, you have to throw the picture away. It's like, sure. sad. it's very sad. <laughs> yeah. You don't like to throw things away. I also, um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Theory's practice, I think this is a 10th of, of what you have. It's maybe a tenth of what you've seen, but it's yeah. I've I've painted. Oh, I mean, we call probably, you prolific, but that's an understatement. Hmm? It's probably a thousand of these, maybe. Yeah. You know. Yeah, so we have sixty-two up in the gallery right now. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, you picked some of the better ones, but some of them I hide. I've hidden away. <laughs> Thank um, you. Yeah, because they, they're, you know, some of them are very personal. Um, this one is again sort of from that, even though the palette is different, this is from the whole kind of re-examining. If, if you examine the history of Western civilization, you, you have to look at the role that religion plays or has played and continues to play in, in, in the direction our society goes. Um, and so, uh, so this is from that sort of series. This is from a series uh, that I started. And I was absolutely sure I had, I thought, you know, it, and this, this is one of the things that's, that's spectacularly funny to me is that and that's my parents. You, 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 um, you think you're doing something and then you paint for a while, you know, you paint 15 or 20 of these that, which I thought was, uh, was going to be pictures of, of, of men, mostly men, sometimes women and their second spouse. So what the idea was, I thought was, you know, this is a great idea. You know, people, particularly of an older generation, get forced into marriages that aren't necessarily their choice. But then later on, if they have some more autonomy and independence, they pick people that they want to be with. And therefore, there's something interesting about that. But of course, you know, when you look back at it, the whole concept is risible. I mean, it's like, that's a picture of my father and my mother. That's uh, that's uh, Trotsky. Sorry, I'm going too fast here. That's, no, that's, no, that's okay. Yeah, I tend to 
my father was a, was a doctor in the Second World War. He met my mother in London. Uh, she was Irish Catholic. He was an Orthodox from an Orthodox family of Jews. Um, and oddly enough, uh, was a doctor attached to a Highland um, regiment. So, uh, so I painted him in Highland gear. Um, you know, to me, this is, uh, you know, two people in love, but also, you know, staring down the memories um, and, and the day-to-day the -day living of, of, you know, of Europe after the whole thing had been torn apart by the Second World War. My father saw some pretty bad things. I mean, being a doctor, he landed at D-Day and fought through the, you know, or as a surgeon through the stuff. So, I mean, it was, it was a pretty horrible experience for him, which he didn't really talk about very much. Um, and then, oops, sorry, wrong way. Um, oh yeah, Trotsky. I mean, you know, I, I really like Frida Kahlo, and I, and I, I really like um, you know the the story of, of of her and Diego Rivera. The you know um, um, there's a certain humility about it, uh, but uh, Frida had a um, uh, an affair with Trotsky, um, who was fleeing Stalin. And Stalin tried to kill him in about five different cities, and eventually killed him in Mexico City, not far from uh, from uh, Frida and uh, Frida and uh, and um, and uh, his house. Uh, that's Madame Sedona. Sedona, I think, is how you pronounce it. Her, his second wife. You know, I mean, Trotsky. Though I, I, I have a, of all of the Russians, I have a great most sympathy for. Um, um, you know, at a certain point, you got to realize that you've done pretty horrible things, even if it's in, in aid of what you consider to be a good and noble thing. Um, and this know, one comp composition is also interesting because they're um, they're they're existing at two different times. Yes, they're existing in two different spaces. You know, Trotsky is sort of looking at the world and thinking, you know, I mean, it's the thousand mile stare. I mean, it's like, you know, I mean, it's not despair, but it's uh, it's a realization um, of things that, you know, I mean, you reexamine your own history and the history of the world. But and, and maybe this is a, you know, the maybe this is my feminist side coming out is, is that the women always get it. Like Sedona gets it, you know. He's just destroyed by the whole thing, you know. But but she is is you know looking at her hand. She's looking at the horror of it all, and she understands. Uh, women women get it, I think, in these situations a lot more than men because men are men are fools. And um, this is another outlier as well. Yeah, this is this is the picture that made me discover that what I thought I was doing with all these pictures had nothing to do. This is a picture of my mother and her sister. Um, you know, and obviously that's not part of the series. They're all done in metallics. Uh, mm -hmm. This is silver metallic and black. They're very monochromatic. Uh, yeah. except I think everybody red. can see the, the metallics in the close-up behind our, yeah. Uh, yeah. our video mm -hmm. there. Yeah. There's something very stark about it. It's almost like uh, I had decided around this time that I wanted to do etchings. Um, and Yan was like, no, you cannot do etchings. You're too clumsy. You know, and he didn't say clumsy, but I think that's what he meant. And he was quite right. I don't control line quite as well in those days as I would, as is necessary for that. And I may never do. For for etching requires a great deal of obsessive compulsive steadiness to, to, to etch plates and things like that. Yeah. Um, Correcting mistakes is much more difficult. It's in your mind, I should say. Yeah. It's almost impossible, really. Yeah. I mean, to, to correct a mistake. And, uh, and, um, and even though, I mean, it, it's complicated. Uh, it's not a medium that I, I would be. I mean, I will at some point in time try it. Um, I've thought a lot about different technique. Um, uh, certainly, uh, William Blake uh, had a similar sort of set of issues. He was a, he was an engraver himself, but he didn't. You know, uh, he wasn't clumsy, but he didn't like the lack of um, of uh, freedom that, uh, that 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 etching. And so he developed a whole technique where he painted acid onto plates. He would etch them, and, and he would etch them with acid. And so the whole um, you know, uh, Songs of Innocent and Experience and Loss and Earth and all that kind of stuff are done in an etching technique that virtually nobody else has used ever, um, which I might try and, and reduplicate. I think it might it might actually work for the, you know, with the technique I have. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's great. You never uh, know. Anne has said, sometimes men are trying very hard to get it without even realizing. Uh, yeah, I guess, you know, I mean, when I say, um, when I say, um, um, I say men, uh, particularly, I mean, it's 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 the more famous, the more powerful men become. Maybe all people, maybe women too, but certainly with men, the less self, um, um, 
realization they tend to have. You know, they get more and more distorted views of themselves. Th this one is an interesting. Uh, uh, this this is a uh, this is Schubert teaching his wife how to play piano. Uh, um, uh, Bach also ta taught his wife, I think his second wife actually, I think his first wife died. Um, 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 he taught his wife to play piano and uh, harpsichord, of course, and it was before the piano and Schubert as well. And um, you know, there's something beautiful I think about that. You know, of loving something so much. I mean, um, the, the Bach and Schubert. I mean, having such great skills, but then you would, you know. You know, Einstein once said, you know, you don't really understand something unless you can explain it to a sixth grader, you know, and, and but very few people who have achieved a, a great deal of, of skill at something would teach, would, would stop and have the patience to teach a sixth grader. But here Schubert and, and Bach both teaching their wives how to play the piano, um, you know, from basic beginners, I mean, two of the greatest keyboard players in the world, um, um, which I find appealing. You know, I think it's a lovely thought. Anyway, I don't know what that we one is. Dan and, this are, one, right? <laughs> Dan and I are scratching our heads because when we when we, we I painted yeah. it and I said, "What the heck is that?" And I said, "Oh, that's so and so and so and so." And he was like, "Oh, right, you're right." You know, yeah. and then and then I forgot. It's something it's a, other. It's a, so uh, again, with the with the curators not making mistakes, right? The um, uh, just if if I have any students listening right now, this is what we call the formal analysis part. You know, it's it's interesting to know what the story behind everything is. But if you look at this conversation between these these uh, five pieces all together, um, then they're telling a, a story without any words, right? Fair enough. I mean, I talk a lot. Um, I paint a lot. Um, I try and keep the two apart. I, I don't really talk about the works except for this show. I mean, it's forced me to. And it's been a learning experience. I mean, it's been an mostly educational for me. I mean, for me, this is the relationship between these two figures. I mean, the 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 the, the figure on the left um, is not dejected, but sad. And the figure on the right is mysterious. I mean, you know, I mean, what is the relation? I mean, obviously, they're related to each other and very closely related. But you don't know what the relationship is. And, and I like the mystery of that. I mean, the, the, there's occasional picture you put in the show that I don't really like that much. You know, it's like but, I mean, this one. I, I like this picture. I just I just can't explain it. Great. So we're moving on down the gallery here. Thanks. Um, he's also um, the, the conversation um, formally is a little more difficult to explain. So let's just I'm going to show you the four in this group. And then we'll talk about kind of why they, they're outliers, even though they might look a little familiar to the rest of the series or the rest of the exhibition. Yeah. Do you have anything to say about these? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, you know, uh, I like uh, I like Egon Schiller, or Schiller, uh, uh, an Austrian-German artist, was one of the 27 Club. Um, he died quite young of, um, um, romantically, actually. His, his, his wife, um, was pregnant with their first child and she got the Spanish flu and uh, he refused to leave her. Um, he, he stayed in the studio with her. Um, even her family lived across the street in a different uh, apartment and he eventually got the flu and died. Um, um, a tragic story. Um, um, but there's an interesting relationship there as well. I mean, Schiller was, would have been one of the great artists of all time. I mean, he's well recognized now, but I mean, he had a Picasso or, uh, or, a, or a go, um, um, or even a Rembrandt level talent, um, and he could do pretty much anything. Um, he, as a young man, he painted a lot of, he drew a lot of drawings, which are kind of a little bit risque, you know, and they're, they're a little disturbing by their sort of overt sexuality. But, you know, if, you know, I, I often think, you know, what would he have painted at age 60? It would have been sensational, and this is this 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 one is a uh, Klimt Gustav Klimt. Um, uh, Schiller became his protege. Um, most artists are kind of jerks, you know. They're very, you know, um, maybe jerks the wrong word. Um, they they're really about themselves, you know. A Klimt um, was enormously generous, um, like Jan is, um, but but enormously generous with his uh, his talents, and he he you know he he really pushed uh, Schiller forward. Um, this is part Sheila, part uh, Klimt, part um, part um, um, Modigliani. Uh, Modigliani, yeah. 
I mean, there's the, the, the freedom of Modigliani,um to, um, and and you know, I, I feel a kinship to Modigliani uh, more so since Jan's uh, you know exhibition of him, um, because he um, he was poor, really poor, um, and and um, he didn't have time to to you know to to revise or to dick around with a painting, you know, like, I mean, you see the works that he did, and most of them were painted very rapidly. You know, I mean, he got a commission to paint a picture of some guy and he could make himself a couple hundred bucks. Like, you know, it was on the easel, it was done. He was walking it across Paris to, to yeah. give to the guy we could eat that yeah. night. Um, and, and that, and, um, that's a sense of immediacy that I, that I think really informed his paintings and make them, you know, brilliant. Yeah. I try and- I want to- um, I just want to be cognizant of the time so that we can get through the whole exhibition. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna rush a little bit, but we're we're coming up on on the big heads and the dogs. That's just my shorthand for the for the groupings <laughs> the that I did. And also, oh, yeah, um, my my anonymous colleague has commented again that you have a strong affinity with Jean Paul Lemieux. Uh, yes um, and no. I don't think so, but other people have pointed that out to me. Um, um, and, and I don't know what to do with that. I, 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 I know his works. I've seen some of his works in person. Um, um, I mean, I take it as a compliment. Um, he's a great artist. Um, but, but it's not uh, where you're coming I mean, from. I don't know. I, I you know, I, I leave myself open to the, to, to seeing it. I don't see it uh, um, yet. I and mean, perhaps I will at some point. These are all, so relationship um, pictures. Yeah. So uh, well, let's, I, I, go I like dogs. let's go to the dogs. Let's go to the dogs. Okay. Big heads first. Okay. Let me big heads. Okay. show everybody behind head the head. curtain here. Yeah. Everybody can see. And I like um, transitioning to this. I know that I've made them small now, but from those outliers that I called them, um, they're just somehow different than the big heads because those relationships are the, su are the substance of the works. Right. Yeah, fair comment, I think, yeah. Okay, there we go. Dogs. Dogs. Uh, this, this is why they're called Higgins. dogs, audience. Higgins. Yeah, it's why they're called dogs. Yeah. Does the dog have the nature of the Buddha? Or does dog have <laughs> Buddha nature? Second, I think, or third cone in the series. Um, and it's the only cone that has an answer. No. Who? Dog does not have the nature of the Buddha. Yeah. But but a dog, I mean, it does, it does what, is the, what is the nature of a dog? I mean, this is a Oops. Rosita, one of my, Did my I miss one? Yeah. one of yeah. um, the pair, a Mexican yeah. street rescue dog. I mean, and that is Rosita. She's like very aggressive. She's got an overbite. She's in your face a lot. She, uh, you know, I mean, my wife adopted her in Mexico when she was like literally as big as the home brand. And, and yeah. you know, they she wouldn't have survived her, Chico. And and now they are, they're-, they're Much really beloved by, by the entirety of downtown Brandon. Yeah. Yeah, they're um, they're yeah, fair enough. Uh, that's uh, this is an abstracted dog. This is is Higgins, my 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 eldest daughter and uh, and her husband's dog. Uh, they live in Sudbury, and they have um, they, this one. I was trying very hard to act. What is the nature of a dog? And and um, so you know, it's it's I don't know. It's uh, there, there are many good pictures of dogs. There's a lot of bad dog pictures, you know. I mean, there's a lot yeah. of trite dog pictures. For me, there's only one profound dog picture in Western history, and that's El Puero. It's in the Prado. It's uh, it's by Goya. It's worth looking at his black pictures, if nothing, see that. I mean, where he's at least some sense of the spirit of the dog. Yeah. And I tried in that last one, the blue one, to, to try and capture, you know, what is that? What is the nature of a dog? In, Mm -hmm. Not enough dogs, not just one individual dog, like like Rosita's dog got an overbite. Yeah. Dog itself, the nature of the dog. Yeah. Um, I've lost one, haven't I? Don't one. you have four? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I must four. Have one. Oh, there's actually 20 pictures, but I just see you. <laughs> well, so you'll have, everybody will have to come down to the gallery to see the fourth one or follow us on our virtual gallery. I think we're going to post yes. the dogs it's individually. It's a picture. It's, um, it's, it's a friend of mine, uh, friend of mine, uh, Doug's uh, dog. He sent a picture of us. He said, hey, I got a dog, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. I it. so I think what's coming up next is um, 
what's behind you here, which I grouped, I, I called them kind of thirties romantic um, when I was, when I was Fair grouping enough. them. Yeah. And I think all of these pastels and this, this um, really um, concerted kind of gradation of color that you have going on here, much less harsh than what we saw in those first ones with the, with the sharp uh, horizon line and, um, and really direct gaze. These are a little bit more if, if you, contemplative. Yeah. Yeah, fair enough. If you don't put a horizon line in, you don't get the fewer, uh, an easy way of categorizing the picture. And if you do with this one, I mean, it's, it's, it's the landscape is empty. I mean, the space is empty. It, it's yeah. just like color grade, you know, and gradation. Um, a lot of this is this. Uh, they're this, in the same color yeah. families as well. They're not, they're not complementing each other. Yeah, yeah fair enough. Here. I, I, I am, I, you know, I'm chaotic, but I'm also sometimes quite, um, um, uh, specific's not the right word. Um, you know, I, 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 what I was doing was using the same painting technique, but going through the color palette, you know, I started off with the reds and yellows and, and oranges, and then, then this turned into the pinks, you know, and then, and then, then, and then I cleaned up my palette blues and stuff so i was trying to see blues yeah. and grays to see how the same painting would look with different colors and this one's an honor to gustav klimt i mean it's a great painter and sure. a great painter of women um particularly uh, um in the sense that um you know his his paintings of women are very um gracious i mean they're very uh they're not beautiful but they're very generous and they're um they're not trite and they're not, they don't objective. I mean, they objectify, but not in that uh, kind of a difficult, you know, unpleasant way. And to me anyway, I mean, mm. he's an old white guy, you know, really old white guy. Uh, yeah, this is, I, I, this, this is me as, me as Wolverine, you know, uh, <laughs> I think. I'm the movie character, right? Not yeah, the animal. Yeah. Oh, but there is something just very, very, um, 30s about this as well, uh, which we saw in the um, the Chaim Soutain from the beginning of the uh, from, of the exhibit as well. I think that there's a treatment of this portrait that that's really evocative of a time from before. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. It may be fairly so. I mean, it, it's as I say. You know, are we? You know, wh wh where is our time going? I mean, clearly the climate change. Is very real and it's going to have a very significant effect on everyone's life. That being said, around here is likely to be one of the. I mean, you know, we don't live on the ocean. We don't live in the yeah. very hot climate. I mean, as long as it doesn't turn into a dust bowl here, which I, I don't think it will, we're relatively shielded from the, the effects. But the, the most of the world's population is going to go through some very difficult times because of that. And there seems to be very little that can, at this point that can be done other than try and mitigate the problems. Yeah. Yeah. So um, with, I, I want to remind you, you have, uh, the audience has five minutes to to let Derry know what you're thinking from wherever you're sitting. Um, and this is what, uh, so this is the angle that we see behind you. And this is what you were referencing earlier in our talk with the singing woman. Singing school, yeah. 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 Um, and it's a... Uh... Yeah. I mean, this is, the, you know, I started off, the, the series is very, very um, uh, intentional. You know, I started off with a very, uh, very, the first two pictures, I think the second or third one, she's more, sing, you know, it's almost, you know, you, I mean, you can, see, if, if, you have, if I said this was a woman singing, you wouldn't have too much trouble seeing it that way. Um, the first two, she's clearly in, in great distress. And this, the, the, a lot of the lines here, you know, reference Modigliani um, and Mondrian, oddly enough. I like Mondrian a lot. Um, um, and then the, the pictures morph. I mean, by the time you get to the 15th or 16th picture in the series, she, you know, she, there's a, I, mean, I think the last picture is three or four people singing in a choir. You know, it's like, um, and so, um, so um, I don't know. This is this also. One. <laughs> I think that uh, it was in conversation with the displaced people, and then um, uh, compositionally, yeah, I wanted it to be next to the singing yeah. woman. For those people who can't see and this in person, both of them use these really, really um, pure colors, and also the, that gold metallic, um, which in the combination becomes a little bit muddy in these muddy 
spots, um, which is which is an interesting use of word. But this one as a stand-in, I know that it's a large series, um, but I love the torque of her of her shoulders um, because I think that it, it transitions that very between yeah the the pain and the the joy um, that it's a transitional moment. Yeah. When when you yeah, I think that's a very vision. When you look at um, both about the pavement, I discovered when you put when you're painting with metallics, particularly gold, um, and you're using a colored pigment, they mix in, in and you get these unusual colors that are that are there. You just it's, it's wild. You don't know what's going to happen, and uh, I like that. Um, I mean, yeah. it's it's scary, but you know, um, this one, yeah, the the, the um, one of the things about Gliani is, 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 you know, they've noted, people have noted the long necks, but a lot of it is how he moves space around, how he manipulates your perception of space. Um, and in his best pictures, um, you know, you've got the anatomical distortions are designed very consciously to create a, a physical movement in the picture that, that may either, um, counter what what the picture is saying or may reinforce it but intentionally so my yeah. brilliant painter i mean really anyway let's see that's the last one of our tour um in two minutes let's visit the big heads real quick unless you have a conclusion that you'd like to uh that you'd like to speak for us this is our wonderful photographer Doug Dirksen was able to put all of them into one. So this is a salon style installation. Um, so Derek, do you want to take it or um, should we just uh, walk them through the big heads for two minutes here? Whatever you want. I'm, I'm here to do right. whatever you want me to do. <laughs> so you uh, largely work vertically. Um, but in this case, I wanted to be sure to include some of the horizontals because your horizon lines are so important, even for interior scenes, like we see there on the top left. Um, and a horizontal horizon has a much different effect than a vertical. Um, sorry, obviously the horizon is always horizontal, but the, the effect that it has in the composition is really marked, I think. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, uh, because I started painting landscapes, um, almost very cognizant of where the horizon line is or where you where you will perceive it i mean where the horizon line i mean you can paint a picture without completely without a horizon line um and you it, it gets implied and i even see interiors i, I always i mean uh, i i mean like the one on the right i mean that, that it's an interior but that's a horizon and the horizon really i mean it does a lot more than divide the the picture to you know um, a, a foreground and background um, um, you know land and sky um, you know or, or if there's two horizons you know if there's a foreground middle ground and background like some of the pictures like the sunglass girl one um, it, yeah. they, they it adds um, uh, it's a compositional element of enormous uh, power in the sense that it sets you know I mean it's, it's tried to say it sets the scene but it does in the sense that moving the horizon line up and down very small amounts making the horizon line uneven so that it's higher on one side and lower on the other, or making the horizon line straight versus, you know, versus having some contour to it, whether things cross the horizon line and how they cross the horizon line. These uh, are, are subtle um, uh, visual clues uh, of enormous um, um, power to the viewer. So, you know, the viewer sees it, even if they don't think they see it. And, and, it, and it tells them a lot about paper. Um, and uh, so, you know, I see horizon lines. Um, I my brain sees them, even if they're not there. You know, I, I mean, I can paint a picture with no horizon line in it, but I know exactly where the horizon line is. Sure. Does that make sense? It absolutely does. As you were speaking, I was thinking about how a horizon line um, also situates the, um, the 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 subject of the painting in in a story. It's either, either their past or their future. It's what they're coming from or what they're heading into. I think that especially with this this bright red one um, in, the, in the bottom, you know that he's he's either arriving from a storm or heading into one because of the violence of that space. There are so many things that you know just by virtue of the fact that you're a human in the world, right? 
Right. You know, no, absolutely. It's true. And, and the, the horizon lines, anyway, it's, it's a kind of a technical yeah. conversation, but, a, but a, to me, it's a, it's, it's a, a very, a very significant, important. I never, I never, uh, there's not, uh, there's no painting that I, I do where the, where the, where the horizon line is or isn't, isn't considered, you know, um, uh, uh, carefully related to the picture and, and a subtle differences of a few millimeters changes, yeah. you know, how, you, how the viewer uh, perceives the picture. Great. Um, so yeah, okay. we're, we're aware of it. Okay. Uh, we have uh, to end we, there. We run out of time. We've run out of okay. time. Um, we got to keep it to a tidy little hour because uh, this will be on YouTube, this entire conversation. Nobody okay. ever watches anything over an hour. Um, the video yeah. will be uh, will be also be uploaded independently. You share that around as okay. much as you like. Um, Lost and otherwise found is up through December. Um, we didn't bother to give it an actual closing date because the holidays, and maybe it'll still be up in January, but um, we'll see. Let's just say through December. And there's a reception on December the second at seven, where you can not only come and speak with Dairy but also our members who have contributed shows to an exhibition um, that will be opening on that day, December the 2nd. Meanwhile, if you are in Brandon, Wednesdays at noon, you can come and get a personal tour from Derry and follow us on in our virtual gallery on Facebook for details and more in-depth captioning about all of this work. I'm sure I'm forgetting something. Mostly, thank you very much, Derry. This has been a joy. Thank you, it's been a great, it's been a pleasure to work with you. We're not done yet. <laughs> well, We're have a great not. night. <laughs> okay. Okay.